to 24 Hours of Past Sony Preview 2018. We are very excited. You could join us today for Melissa, Melissa's code, uh, Azure Data Lake, what, why, and how session. Uh, this 24 Hours of Past consists of 24 consecutive live webinars delivered by expert speakers from the past community. This session will be recorded and posted online after the event. You will receive an email letting you know uh, when the recordings are available and any other additional details. My name, name is uh, Jose Luis Rivera. I'm the leader of the PASS Global Spanish virtual group, and you can find us at PASS Global Spanish, uh, globalspanish.pass.org. I have a few introductory slides before I can hand over to uh, Melissa. Uh, please, Melissa, next slide. Uh, if you require any te technical assistance, please type your questions into the question panel located on the right side of the screen, and someone will assist you. You can use that uh, question and, and answers panels as well. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, uh, feel free to ask your questions, and we'll get uh, those questions uh, during the session or at the end in the Q&A portion. So I will read this, this question to, uh, to the speaker, and the speaker will, will ask them. Uh, you can use the Zoom uh, function in the um, uh, presentation area if you can uh, want to zoom in and so, or zoom out the presentation. And please know that there's going to be a short evaluation at the end of the session, so please, your feedback is, is really important to us, so take a moment to complete it. It's just going to take one, two minutes, and it will pop up at the end of the webinar in, the, in your web browser. Next slide, please. Um, I will take a moment to thank uh, our presenting sponsor, Quest. This staging of 24 Hours of Pass will not be possible without the generous sponsors and the support. And they will be there. The, they are the reason that this event is completely free, free of charge for you. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Quest uh, and sign up for the information uh, they, and how they can help you, please visit the sponsor page on the 24 Hour of Pass website. Next slide, please. Uh, PASS is a global not-for-profit organization where data professionals connect, share, and learn. Joining PASS is completely free and gives you access to hundreds of hours of free online content, live virtual events like this one, in-person events, uh, the ability to join uh, local groups in your area, and the opportunity to attend the annual conference PASS Summit. PASS is a great way to connect with like-minded professionals, increase your technical experience, and grow your career. Uh, for more inf information, please visit pass.org. And here's our presenter for today is uh, Melissa Coates. Melissa is a solution architect with Blue Granite based in Charlotte, North Carolina. She specializes in delivering analytics, data warehousing, and business study solutions using on-premises, cloud, and hybrid technologies. Formerly a CPA, Melissa is ridiculously proud to be an IT geek and downright giddy to be a Microsoft Data uh, Platform MVP. When Melissa step away from the keyboard, uh, you can probably find her hanging out with her brother Cooley, uh, paddle boarding, or uh, playing in the garden. Melissa blogs at sqlchic.com. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Melissa for the for his session, her session, sorry. Melissa, all yours. Thanks, Jose, and hi to everyone. Today we're going to talk about Azure Data Lake. Our agenda is here. As you can see, we're going to start with a couple of high-level 10,000-foot uh, view concepts. Then the middle section is where we're really going to talk about the technical services of Azure Data Lake and a couple of demos, and then we're going to shift back into the high level and hopefully tie some things together uh, by the course of the end. So let's start first with an overview of what is a data lake. So first and foremost, it's a repository, and the focus is on storing large quantities of data. And generally, we store it in its native format, how it comes out of the source. So for instance, if we have log data or if we have tweet data from social media, all of those unusual data types are very well suited to a solution like a data lake. And although we focus on the repository quite a bit, the other aspect of a data lake is usually the processing engine as well. 
In terms of objectives, because a data lake can store all of those different unusual types of data, we very much reduce that upfront effort of acquiring data. And that's because it doesn't need a schema initially. And basically what we mean by that is just like the, uh, the, uh, your laptop, the drive there does not care what kind of file you drop on it just like a data lake. Conversely, a relational database, we've had to define a table in the past, right? And define the data types and the columns before we can even load data. So that's what we mean when we're talking about really reducing that upfront effort and making new data much more easily available. That gives us the opportunity to store lots of different types of data that maybe we wouldn't have bothered with before and hopefully do so in a really cost efficient way to, to reduce the, the cost of, of our data over time. So um, that deferring the work up front, we're basically deferring the work to schematize the data. And that's what we mean by schema on read in the big data world. So when we are loading, say, a relational database, we call that schema on write because it's defined up front. And here we're calling it schema on read. And the reason it's called that is because we're defining the schema while we're querying the data and pulling it out. And I'm going to show you that in some USQL scripts here in just a few minutes. And basically, all of this means that we can be faster. There's trade-offs to this speed, but nonetheless, we can be faster with acquiring and getting access to some data. Um, it also really helps us get access to that low latency data that might be coming in in streams or micro batches. And it also helps facilitate advanced analytics scenarios and so forth. There's a few use cases that I want to highlight. And the first one you've actually already heard me talk about, and it's really just ingesting new file types. So your manager comes to you and says, our trucking system is going to start emitting telemetry. Where are you going to store that data? And a, a data lake basically gives you that opportunity to say, all right, I have a place to land it. Start to look at it, analyze it, figure out what we want to do with it long term, and then do those exploratory analysis to, to basically buy you some time. Um, data science and Hadoop very much go hand in hand with a data lake. So here, of course, we're talking about the, the world of big data and Apache projects like Hive and Storm and, and Kafka and all those uh, good fun farm names, right? Um, Towards the bottom of the blue box, we're also showing in this diagram a data science sandbox or a, an analytical sandbox. And so that's pretty common uh, when we're talking about those initial exploratory solutions um, to give those data scientists or the, the data analysts a place to work and from which uh, things are operationalized into another area when they become production ready. Another really common way to get started in dipping your toe into a data lake is to start using it as a staging area for your data warehouse. So in data warehousing, we typically like to bring that data in from a source, stage it before we then apply all those transformations and restructure it so it's optimal for reporting, et cetera, et cetera. And so particularly if you're looking for your data lake to store history over time, moving the staging functionality over to the data lake is one possible way to, to start utilizing it and learning it um, and then offload some of that effort from the, from the data warehouse itself. Closely related is also using it for maybe some active archiving. And here we're showing the age data coming back into the data lake from the data warehouse, but really that could be from you know, any system where you basically need an active archive. Maybe this data is only queried once a quarter or once a year, uh, and so it, it doesn't necessarily need to perform exceedingly well, but it does need to be available for querying, and it can definitely serve those sorts of use cases as well. And last, I can't uh, neglect mentioning a Lambda architecture. So here we're talking about a speed layer for that real low latency data. We're talking about a batch layer for housing 
that data, uh, and, and in this case, we're showing both the data lake and a data warehouse as, as part of the batch layer, and then a serving layer for the, the pieces where we're actually going to serve up the data to the, to the end users, and a data lake can be a really important part of that, and we'll, we'll talk a, a little bit about that more uh, in just a moment. So the next thing that I want to do is kind of a thousand foot level view of big data in Azure. So here we are seeing the most common services that we would see employed for a big data platform here in Azure. So across the bottom, we have our storage. So as the name implies, where we're going to store the data. And across the top, we have some different compute services. And then uh, across the right here are, are, the, are the virtual machines that are also an option. And so in terms of uh, the storage, if we start there, because we always sort of want to build up from, from the data uh, initially, the, the decisions between Azure Storage and Azure Data Lake Store is uh, kind of a big one. And there's quite a few differences. This here, uh, I'm actually going to post a blog post here shortly with uh, quite a few more things that compare them. But fundamentally, Azure Data Lake Store is, is more of a file and folders hierarchical system. It, when you see a demo in a moment, it's going to look pretty familiar as if it were like the file system on your laptop, uh, whereas Azure Storage is, is more about blobs. And so Azure Storage is much more of a general purpose uh, storage layer and Azure Data Lake Store is, is more optimized for analytic workloads, which we will talk about here uh, in just a moment. In terms of the compute pieces, um, there are a number of different choices as well, and this doesn't even get into to various third-party options. And so in terms of making some decisions there, on the very leftmost here is is the IaaS or infrastructure as a service option where really you've got all full control. Here's where you're talking if you're running, say, a Cloudera or a Hortonworks type of distribution, right? On the far right, we have Azure Data Lake Analytics, and that's focusing really on running jobs as opposed to managing a cluster, which would be more of the case with HD Insight. So um, I don't want to spend too much time talking here because really the focus of this session is on Azure Data Lake. So to, to take those services, the compute and the storage services down, these three of what you just saw earlier are the three that are under the umbrella of Azure Data Lake. And although HD Insight uh, is great and, and does a lot of things, for the, the rest of this particular presentation, we're actually going to focus on the store and the analytics service. So in terms of building on uh, this particular uh, graphic, we're going to do that a couple of times here. So uh, we've got the various data sources here on the left. We're going to drop our data into the Data Lake store. And the store itself can integrate with Azure Data Lake Analytics or these other Azure, Azure items. Now, if we start building on here, um, in Azure Data Lake Analytics, we talked a moment ago about it being a uh, compute service, right? And so its focus is on job processing and U-SQL jobs, which you'll see here in just a moment. And I will also explain what the catalog here is in just a moment, but you can think of it right now as just reusable objects like tables and views and stored procedures. And when we start setting up the catalog, one of the things that we can do is issue distributed queries to other locations like Azure SQL Database, Data Warehouse, and a SQL Server and a VM as shown down here on the bottom right. We've also got a number of different tools available for creating our jobs and managing everything. Uh, in this session, you're only going to see the Azure portal, um, but there's a whole bunch of, of other options as well. We have built in to Azure Data Lake Analytics, we have these built-in uSQL extensions, which mean that you can run things like Python and R and cognitive services type algorithms directly from within your uSQL script, which is really cool. 
And extensibility is built in uh, via C Sharp, and we'll talk more about that here in just a moment as well. So this is kind of your high level view of uh, the, the Azure Data Lake store and analytics pieces. At the really high level, Jose, do we have any questions so far that we want to address before I go into the technical piece? We have no questions so far, Melissa. Awesome. Okay. So let's talk about Azure Data Lake Store. So this is storage as a service. And the idea here is we don't have file size limits. We are uh, completely unaware of, of formats and that this storage is really optimized for analytics. So we can do things like parallelized reads and low latency writes and so forth. So in terms of building onto the store, um, just like with the analytics service that you saw a moment ago, we can use the portal, we can use PowerShell, we can use a variety of different things to interact with the store as well. So how you want to think of the store is basically a foundation. So on top of that foundation, we have a variety of these different compute services. And so um, in terms of where to start, starting with a, a solid foundation on the store and uh, planning that out well is, is time invested well. And we'll talk a little bit at, at the end about that as well. And in terms of that choice between, well, geez, do I want to use Azure Data Lake Analytics or maybe Databricks? It's not an either or, right? The store is your data storage, which can be reusable across these, these various services. And there's a couple different ways that you can get to it uh, through the web HDF and HDFS endpoint or through the ADL file system. Now, why are we saying that we can have files of any size? And that is because it's a distributed file system. So if you see here, we've got the data that is basically distributed across these various backend storage nodes. So that's how we accomplish the parallelized reads, right? Um, and that's how we get fault tolerance. So these are, these are HDFS type concepts, right? And so one caveat, I'm not going to go into very many nitty gritty details in, in this sort of high level webinar, but although any size limit is allowed, um, there's a sweet spot, right? So many, 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 many teeny tiny files doesn't perform as well and massively sized files also um, might not perform as well. So, so there's, a, there's a practical size limit, even though there's not a technical size limit. So let me show you what the, what the Data Lake store actually looks like. So if we come over here to the Azure portal, I have a Data Lake store that's already provisioned and it's called Banking ADLS. And so inside of Azure Data Lake store, where I want to go is the, an area called the Data Explorer. And it, just like the name sounds, it lets us navigate through this hierarchical structure that we have. So I have a set of data um, that I have called ATM machine data. And I have some various areas like my raw data uh, and my curated data and so forth. And as is very common in big data solutions, um, we've got some various folders that are partitioned by time. This particular one only goes down to the month level. But of course, this structure is completely up to you and the naming conventions are completely up to you. Azure Data Lake, uh, or specifically USQL, is case sensitive. So um, it's a, actually a pretty big decision for you to decide whether or not to use um, this proper case like I'm showing here versus something like all lowercase. But here inside of, of say, the, the September file, uh, I'm sorry, folder, we've got a couple different CSV files. And I can click on the file here in our Data Explorer and just kind of take a look at a preview of what what's contained in this file. And the little dealie is hiding my, my clothes. So let me resize things here a moment. And there we go. 
And we also have various other, you know, properties that we can take a look at. So we've got different file properties. Um, in fact, we can we can query these as well. And every every file actually has a full fledged path. Another kind of interesting aspect, if I go back in here, is uh, we can also set auto expiration dates on files in the data lake store if if we like. We can download and upload files here manually in the in the portal for kind of onesie twosie type situations. Um, obviously, normally they get here in, in more of an automated fashion as well. And then earlier I did mention that we've got lots of different ways to interact with Azure Data Lake Store, but um, PowerShell is one that I have found in my projects to be uh, very, very, very valuable. So here's just a couple of really quick examples of creating a, a new folder and uploading a file. Um, we've got uh, a number of different commandlets that are available and uh, you'll find your, yourself commonly using them. Okay, so now let's talk about the compute side or the query side. So Azure Data Lake Analytics or ADLA is the big data processing or the or the query side of of this that sits on top of the storage. And it's essentially a yarn application that is meant to work with Azure Data Lake Store. So you heard me say earlier we can reach into other sources like blob storage or Azure SQL database, um, but it's it's really optimized for, for ADLS. And the idea here is our big focus is on running jobs. And so we're not focusing on how is the how is the cluster configured. We are only running jobs. So here you have seen this before. Let me elaborate a little bit more from what we saw before. So here kind of towards the top middle, we see job one and job two. And job one has these two little squares in it and job two is four. And what that's meaning to represent is that the scale or the horsepower, so to speak, that we define is at the job level. So if job one doesn't really need that much horsepower, we, we basically assign AUs or analytic units at the job level. And so job one is, well, theoretically gonna cost less than job two, depends on how long it runs, right? So, um, so the, the scale level per job is a really nice feature. And then we also have the concept of the reusable catalog um, that we will talk more about here in, in just a couple of moments. And we already went through um, these other pieces with the distributed queries and the built-in extensions and so forth. So uSQL or unified SQL is essentially the, the language we use with ADLA right now. It is a blend of SQL that we are familiar with, as well as C Sharp. So it's this blend of declarative and imperative. And for folks with the background in both, it has got a world of power uh, available to you, as you can probably imagine by, by just knowing that the combination exists. And so the idea here is that we can we can operate on unstructured and semi-structured data pretty much as easily as we can with you know, normal structured data that we would have, say, in SQL Server. And the ability to parallelize across the nodes, where we were saying that Azure Data Lake Store is a distributed system, uSQL understands how to do that without you having to code it or, or tell it anything. You just tell it how many analytic units the job gets, and it handles all that under the covers for us uh, because it's software as a service, right? Um, so, so really our focus here is on productivity. So in that chart before we said it's kind of on the right side of the chart at the top right because it's the easiest entry point for things like big data queries. Now here's the big thing to know about current state. What is supported today for uSQL queries are batch processing queries, and we can write that output to either the data lake store or to blob storage. 
there's other pieces we can read from, but we can only write or output to the store or blob storage. And so that's a really critical thing to know because you can't use USQL as an interactive query language that's going to show you results on the screen. Not right now. On their future roadmap, they have stated interactive queries, machine learning queries, streaming queries are all on the roadmap. But as of right now, it's a batch processing language that outputs to a file. So I want to make sure that that's super clear. So let's do a quick little USQL tutorial, if you will. And so I'm going to go through this, uh, this script here. And I'm not going to actually go from line one at the top to the, to the bottom. I'm going to introduce concepts. And, and we're going to go through the script that way. So we first have the concept of an extract statement, which just means I'm going to read some data from a file. And so this extract statement is key because it's performing schema on read. So way at the beginning when we said, hey, we have all that flexibility, we just drop the file in, where we pay the piper, so to speak, is at query time here because now we have to define the structure. So it's a pay me now or pay me later proposition. Here we are saying, okay, on row seven, column one is a machine number and it's a string data type. Column two, right? So, so um, the, the entire contents of the source file have to be present in this schema on read um, or it will fail. So for instance, see how down on row 16 I've got, I'm, I'm selecting machine number, then I'm summing by my two transaction columns. Nowhere do I actually use that from row 10 there's a, there's a transaction start date time. Nowhere am I actually using that in the output, but it has to be in the schema on read in the extract statement. That extract statement's getting, getting data from where? And in this case, I'm getting it from my variable, uh, the input file variable that's declared up on rows one and two. And it's, it's referring to a path in my data lake store. It's my ATM machine data folder, raw data subfolder. And in this case, I'm pointing the source to one individual file, which means the immediate question you're going to say, but Melissa, what if I have more than one file? And that's, uh, that can be handled through what we call file sets. So these little curly braces represent file sets in something like file name. And our date are what we call virtual columns. So um, we are telling it in row two up here how to expect that those date partitions to work. And so for me, it's by year and month in my, in my folder structure. Now, because those are up there and in the, in the path, they have to be present in the schema on read. So they have to be present in the extract statement, which is why they're sitting there on rows 11 and 12 as well. Um, uh, just a tip, these types of inter iteration techniques to say, go get all of the files that are in this particular file path are very common in, in these big data uh, projects. And so that's why a rule of thumb when you're designing your data lake is within one particular folder structure, unless you're using something like JSON or XML, and that's different, but usually you want to have one format for that folder structure so that these types of iteration techniques continue to work. All right, so we've extracted that data from that source input file. Now we're back to just pointing to one input file here in this example. Next, we've got uh, starting on row 14 and through row 20, we've got our select statement. So we're basically saying, all right, first I got my data and defined it. And now we're going to say, well, how do I want it to look? And this is just normal, familiar SQL dialect. And then finally on row 22, we're saying, well, I need to output it. And where do I want to output it? Well, I have to output it to a file. And it has to be either the data lake store or blob storage like we talked about. Now, this is outputting to just one file. So similar to the earlier question, you might say, Melissa, well, what if I wanted to do something dynamic and automatically partition my output based on some criteria? 
that's in private preview right now. And so that's something that you can actually request access to from the Data Lake team if that's something that you're interested in doing. Currently, we have a handful of what we call built-in extractors and out outputters. So here I'm using CSV or comma separated format for both my, my extractor to get my source data and also to output it. Our built-in ones currently are comma separated, tab separated, and text. Those are, those are fully out there and have been for quite some time. Parquet is in public preview and ORC is in private preview. Now, if you have other data types like JSON, for instance, and, and among others, uh, GitHub has a number of different examples. So extensibility with C Sharp and .NET is built into the product. It's not an afterthought. It's very much part of the, the fabric of the product, so to speak. And so um, although these right now are custom, which just means you have to kind of install it in your data lake for right now until more and more of these become built in. Um, many of them are already available or you can absolutely write your own. Now row sets. So on row five and row 14, we're defining row set variables. And that really just is, I think of it kind of like a comma table expression conceptually in that I'm telling it, well, I kind of want to do this first, and then I want the rows to flow through the script and do this next. But the really nice thing is that um, it's not, it doesn't actually perform these three steps separately. Um, it, it's more optimized to handle it uh, more gracefully. Now, here's the thing is if you're copying and pasting or maybe doing a save as with a script, and if you forget and you leave a row set in from an old script that is not somehow contributing to the output, um, you'll get an error because it says, well, I don't know what that is and I don't know what to do with it. So it is a bit intolerant of something like that, but it's kind of cool actually because it keeps your scripts nice and tidy. Up at the top, you've already seen my couple of variables. So uh, these are basically C-sharp conventions. The entire script is case sensitive. So um, thing, and also things like semicolons are absolutely required. So a lot of SQL people are not used to writing semicolons all the time. Um, here, you, you absolutely have to. And something like an as for an alias is required. I don't mind that because I like the as for re readability. Um, so, so I kind of like that that it's that it's uh, requiring that. So, so these separate row sets use what they call a selective refinement processing model, and so it's basically compiled down into one ex one expression. We have to use C-sharp data types and expressions. So for SQL people, something like the decimal question mark uh, might look a little unfamiliar. Um, that just means it's nullable. And if it detects a null and you haven't set it to be nullable, you will get an error. So it's very important to get that right. The other thing to know is that keywords have to be uppercase. And so the, the product team made that, made that compromise because of that integration between SQL and C Sharp, and it allows them to do some various things easier. Um, and this was kind of the trade-off. Um, again, I don't mind it because I like to write my scripts this way anyways. So uh, a result of that is something like see my aliases on row 17 and 18. You actually couldn't alias a column in all caps because USQL would think you're using a keyword because keywords are all caps and you would get an error. So that, that's, a, that's a good thing to know. Uh, lastly, the thing I wanna point out, and these are actually brand new here recently, are uh, some various things that you can add into your actual data in terms of file properties and metadata. And the, the examples are shown here. And so that can obviously be really helpful for you for things like auditing and, and figuring out data lineage, where a piece of data came from and so forth. So that's your quick USQL tutorial. The cost model 
is based on AUs. So AUs or analytic units are the horsepower that you define. And so what you pay for is the time that it runs time, times the number of AUs that you allocated for the job. And so essentially it affects the number of containers used to parallelize that affects, you know, that distributed set of the data behind the scenes and so forth. And so cost wise, one AU for 60 minutes is two bucks right now. And that's without any discounts, of course. Um, and, and they have some prepaid commitments as well that uh, and end up offering discounts that are that are pretty sizable. So if you know that you have a lot of activity going on and maybe you say I want to prepay I don't know $500 a month right um, that then ends up being more cost effective than doing the $500 uh, pay as you go and then storage of course because since our compute and our storage are decoupled we pay for our storage space separately and although Azure Data Lake storage is more expensive than blob storage um, it's certainly not expensive um, a terabyte is you know about forty dollars a month currently in the portal there's an AU analyzer and so basically it helps you figure out very clearly did I overspend and so it it helps you after you have run the job for the first time to start looking at ah okay well did I over allocate? And in this case, our black line, it looks like we allocated 10 AUs and it used them up until a certain point where it goes down and gets more jagged. And then we were over allocated for the whole rest of the time. So we can kind of take a look and figure out, you know, what's my objective? Do I want to save money or do I want to get it done as fast as possible? Now, the other thing to be aware of is kind of how we can use this with our different services. So we've talked about how our ADLA or our Azure Data Lake Analytics account, our USQL scripts, we can run them and we can read and write to our Azure Data Lake store or ADLS. And every ADLA account has a default storage that has to be defined. I can also tell it to be aware of other Azure Data Lake store accounts or Azure Blob Storage. So the same ADLA account can write and read to these multiple different storage locations. As you already know, we can also read from these other SQL database type of options that are in Azure. I can also maybe create another ADLA account or maybe an HD Insight cluster and also interact with those other data lake store accounts. So lots of flexibility uh, if, if you need it, depending on your scenario. Now, the last thing here that I wanna mention is about query execution. We have four phases. Uh, the four phases in this screenshot are those little check marks across the top left of the screenshot. So basically we prepare it, we queue it, we run it, we finalize it. The queuing basically means if you've got a lot of people in your system and if you've got some limit set on how high or how many AUs are allowed, um, certain, uh, certain scripts might start getting queued up and need to wait. And there is a priority level. In fact, I think I call it out here. So um, this particular script had a priority level of 1,000, which is the default, a lower number, and you can set it per script, a lower number is, is actually higher in the queue it's kind of an inverse we also can keep track of the submitter and um, if we're say executing a job from azure data factory and we're running usql from from data factory this this could show a service principle for instance every job also gets its own unique id and url we can also take a look at the number of aus and of course that affects parallelization it also affects the stages of our work and the and the number of vertices so this green box here is what we call a super vertex and that's a stage of work and within it we could have one or more vertices um, or units of work there's lots and lots and lots and lots to know about this aspect of things so I am not going to elaborate on that much other than to tell you a couple of things 
keep in mind that when you set AUs, it's at the job level. So remember that job a minute ago when we said, oh, it was doing good at the 10 AUs and then it was over allocated. So sometimes your tuning is, oh, maybe this should be split up into two jobs, right? Sometimes that's the, the best way. But although you control specifically the number of AUs assigned, you only influence the vertices by things like not only the AUs that are assigned, but things like how good is your syntax, how have you partitioned and distributed the data, et cetera, et cetera. And lastly, over here, this is a screenshot of the Data Lake store. Every job that gets executed by Azure Data Lake, it actually has a, a fully date partitioned scheme and it keeps track of all of the details behind what was run. And so that can be helpful. And I'll show you what that looks like here inside of the portal. Let me just look at a quick time check here. And oh, wow, I am running really out of time. OK, so I did very poorly in time management. So what I'm going to do is instead of running them in the portal, I'm going to save some time and just tell you the key points that um, I was going to run and, and then we'll, we'll show you the, the most important pieces. So here we have a, a example of where we're just going to join two files. So in this case, we have one row set where we're getting um, the data just like we did before. And then we have a second row set where we're getting a secondary file. This one happens to be uh, a what we're calling in a piece of master data. It's just a lookup table for what a, a transaction type and number means. And because I have done the schema on read up here uh, starting on row 25, that means down here in the actual select statement, I can just do a nice easy outer join. So in the portal, if I come back over here, I actually did run these earlier, so that'll make this easy. So if I were to run a job in, in the portal, by the way, I would click this new job button. I would paste in the script that you just saw. I would give it a good job name, and you'll know why that's important in a second. You'll assign the AUs here with the slider. There's a couple of options here. You have to click the more options to show the priority. So lower number is higher priority in a busy system and a custom runtime version if you're trying out a preview feature. All right, so if I had already run that, I am going to now go to my job history. So here I've got the job history and now you can immediately tell why giving a good job name is important because you can see here that um, it's, it's exposed in the job history. So we see the status, the job name, the number of AUs, the type, uh, the duration, who, who ran it, et cetera, et cetera. So here, if I go here inside the job, all that history we said that it keeps um, is rendered here in a visual way um, in this aspect. So we've got the job graph with all of the details of how it performed. We've got the actual script that was run. We've got links to the source data inputs as well as a direct link to the output. So you could jump straight there from here if you wanted. Um, an AU analysis. So this particular one, I assigned 10 AUs and I totally overspent. I only used two AUs. And then diagnostics. So I don't have any errors or warnings, but it does very clearly tell me that nine AUs were over allocated. So that's a really nice way to help us be uh, cost efficient. All right, we caught up a little time there since I, I speeded up the, the query run piece. So the other part of Azure Data Lake Analytics that's really important is the catalog. And so this is all about sharing and reusing objects. And by the way, this is the Azure Data Analytics Catalog, or uSQL Catalog, as some people call it. Azure Data Catalog is a totally different service. So this is different. All right, so why do we like this? So let's say we want to reuse some data or logic across lots and lots of uSQL scripts. 
um, we might want to reuse some code, right? So we put something in stored procedures, and then our use SQL script just calls the stored procedure instead of repeating logic over and over and over and over. When we when we set things up in the catalog, um, we don't have to do all the schema on read work anymore. So our syntax is shorter for analysts, and I'll show you an example of that. And so essentially what that means is we're imposing schema on write sometimes in order to make the code easier and to centralize that. It's also the way that we go about registering a custom assembly. So for instance, I go out to GitHub and I say, I wanna run some JSON extracts and outputs, register the custom assembly that knows how to do that and I'm off and running. And also this is how we connect to a remote data source like Azure SQL database and so forth um, because we set up the, uh, the credentials and the, the data source to, to be able to go find those here in the catalog. There's two types of tables. One is a normal managed table. So the data lives in Azure Data Lake. And so that's just a normal create table statement. The other is an external table. So this is the same concept as SQL Server. This external table is metadata only. We're not picking up and moving the data. The data is going to stay living in the other system. So again, I'm gonna save time and not actually run the query. But what I wanna show you is, because I have defined before when I did uh, this join in the first query to get this transaction lookup data, uh, I had to do the schema on read in a row set here. Now in this case, um, it's all set up and defined in the catalog. So all I have to do is join to it. So my syntax and my usability for a user got way easier. Now in terms of going and looking at the catalog, here's the other big thing to know. Inside of Azure Data Analytics, we also have a data explorer. That's the one that you wanna look at to look at catalog objects, not the one in Azure Data Lake Store. So here, for instance, um, I've got, say, here's the table and the, the structure for the table that I set up that I just went and did that join with. And so um, then we can go ahead and, and use it in the use SQL script. So for instance, um, this particular one that's in the ATM schema um, is an actual manage table. And then this other one that's just an external table, I put it in the EXT schema because I like to identify it that way. Um, he, uh, he's just metadata only. Okay, so moving on. In a multi-data platform, we don't live in isolation and we've got to integrate with lots and lots of different things, right? We might have a data warehouse, we might have marts, we might have a Hadoop cluster, we might have a, an operational data store, NoSQL, um, you get the the picture, right? So, so this is um, very common these days that these types of systems are getting more and more broad. And so there's, there's one thing that I wanna point out though, and that's this idea of an inverse relationship between the lake and your data warehouse. And the lake doesn't usually replace your data warehouse, particularly if you have one that already exists. So we said earlier that acquiring your data in the lake is easier. So that's less effort, but it was more effort uh, in the warehouse. Whereas data retrieval should be nice and easy in the warehouse because you've done all that work, but is more effort on the lake side. So that means these guys are complementary solutions um, and, and both are very, very important. And so as part of this uh, multi-platform system, we have um, not only data integration where we pick up and move the data, but we have data virtualization that is occurring, which means I basically want to query the data where it lives. I don't want to pick it up and move and create another copy of it. With Azure Data Lake Analytics, there's two ways that we can approach that. One is we call schemaless or lazy metadata, which I think is a funny name. And basically um, that means in Azure Data Lake Catalog, 
it knows where the data source is, but I have not actually defined the full schema on write structure. So that means the structure still is created in the query. And if that underlying data source, like your SQL data source, is still kind of a moving target, this gives you flexibility to get at the data through a federated query, but not have to, to actually pick up and move it and not have to um, fix the schema yet except in the query. Now, once it's stabilized and is unchanging, then what you can do is add to this picture an external table, which is the full schema. And that then makes it easier for your analysts and so forth. But the kicker is, at this point in time, if you start using the predefined schema or the external table in the, the Data Lake catalog, what that means is if somebody sneaks in a new column in the SQL source and it's not in your external table, your query is going to fail. So it really does need to be for a very stable uh, SQL solution. So this here is, is a representation of the read and write that we can perform not only with these virtualized USQL queries, but the same idea with respect to using Polybase or Elastic Query, which are both similar ideas but different uh, when it comes to querying data where it lives in another remote database. So Polybase, we um, typically use it to load data. So in this case, it might be from the data lake um, to, say, uh, an Azure Data Warehouse, for instance. Um, in this case, um, that might be a perfect situation for, say, using it where our staged data is in the data lake store. And then we end up uh, loading it to the data warehouse. Alternatively, um, we might implement something to the effect of where um, the external tables in the data warehouse reference very new data or very old data and uh, more of a managed table in the data warehouse has everything in between and then some database views union them together. So these are some techniques we can use to kind of handle the, the quick arriving data or the very old data. Okay, so I'm going to finish with just a couple of these comments and then then we'll handle questions. So um, these these slides are available on not only the past site but also on my website which is at sqlchick.com and there's a presentations and downloads page. So I'm going to let you read through most of these on your own um, so that we can take some questions. Um, but the the big point that I want to make is that um, uh, I've talked to a number of customers that a data lake actually may or may not be the right choice depending on the use cases. And there's also a readiness aspect because there are different development patterns and so forth. So a lot of things that you want to think about are what types of data you have, data volumes, the formats, um, what kind of data integration do you want to do versus say data virtualization. And then what do you value more, right? So we showed that that really complicated multi-structured architecture where you might be saying, well, gosh, I really value architectural simplicity more, or do you value best fit engineering more? And and so, you know, the the compromise in the middle is, is usually the right answer, right? So um, depending on if you're creating something brand new or augmenting something that already exists, lots of these these types of things factor into it. And your information delivery is really important, right? You've got to put some layer on top of the data lake in order to make it useful for, for your end users. Um, organizing the data lake is super important. Um, I write and talk about this all the time. I could talk about this for the entire hour. Um, but there's lots of different ways that um, you want to think about organizing the data lake so that it does not turn into the dreaded data swamp. And there's a number of techniques that you might use um, uh, with zones. And, and I talk about this on my blog as well. Um, with these different zones that could be conceptual or physical, but just kind of help you you know, get things um, to where they are easily retrievable and so forth. So um, lots and lots of challenges. So um, just like we've learned with data projects forever, the, you know, this is no different. It's just uh, a little things with a, with a twist on it. 
So I want to point out there's a, a number of things here in the appendix. There's a whole lot of links here for uh, more Azure Data Lake information. The Azure Data Lake team does a wonderful job of keeping their documentation up to date. Um, they do a really, really good job. Um, here on the third page of it is some various blog posts I have on my site that you might find relevant. And here's some various definitions if I use some terms that you're not familiar with. And uh, there's, you know, where you can find the, the copy of the presentation. So with our remaining few minutes, um, are there any questions, Jose, that we want to try to handle? Uh, yes, we have a couple ones. Um, the first one, uh, you already talked about it, but I'll, I'll say it out loud that just in case you want to say something else. Uh, does ADL work with uh, Polybase? Does ADL work with Polybase? So Polybase, when it's within the database side, so it's basically within, say, SQL Server or Azure SQL Data Warehouse, not in Azure SQL Database, but over there we have Elastic Queries, which is different, but similar. So in terms of, of Polybase reaching from Azure SQL Data Warehouse into your data lake, so that would be into the data lake store. We can do that from the Azure SQL Data Warehouse product. We, we cannot currently do that from SQL Server, not even SQL Server 2017, but I really have my fingers crossed that that's coming. So right now the best integration there for Polybase is with Azure SQL Data Warehouse, which of course is the large scale MPP type of system, which is a different creature. Um, and that's a that's a totally different conversation. Um, but if you're not familiar with it, um, definitely spend some time learning about the differences be, because he is he is different, different design patterns, different data loading patterns. Excellent. Next question is: Can USQL mix with T-SQL? So the absolutely. Um, so with USQL, since it's a blend of SQL and C sharp, um, the SQL syntax is not T SQL specific, um, but it's more like um, I guess I don't know specifically if it's ANSI standard. Um, but the answer is yes. It's just not geared at T SQL. It's more like a, a SQL syntax. Perfect. Um, will the job execute when we allocate a use lower than supposed? Oh, um, it will still, as far as I know, it will still try to execute. And there is a timeout threshold that is escaping me right now. I want to say it's five hours, but I would need to double check my memory on that. Um, so, so as far as I know, the answer is yes, but we couldn't set it so low so that it would take, say, a week to run. We can't be that cheap. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you have any, we have a couple minutes. If you have any other questions, please uh, type it. Um, we have a uh, one non ADL related, and that was speak out loud and do you know which R version is, is, is using? Oh, uh, off the top of my head, I do not. I know they've got, uh, I know they've got it documented, uh, you know, at what level they're at, uh, either within the SQL Server piece or even within uh, what's integrated within the Azure Data Lake Analytics uh, piece. But off the top of my head, I, I can't, I can't give you that exact version number. Perfect. Um, we are running out of time, so uh, we um, we have a lot of, of sessions coming up with, in this 24 hour path. We'll still have way through, so stay tuned for our next uh, session, the SQL Server Transaction Law for Developers, a sneak peek by, by Frank Hill. So uh, in the next minute, we will pass to, to Frank for our next session. So Thank you all for attending this 24-hour pass.
and uh, remember to uh, participate in in the summit, which is which coming in 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 November. And well, you can see the full sessions of these uh, presentations there in the in that big event. Thank you, Melissa.